Welcome to Hill Country Homilies, weekly homilies from Holy Annunciation Orthodox Church in Liberty Hill, Texas. Holy Annunciation is an old calendar Orthodox Church, sharing the faith of the apostles and the love of Christ with all who seek His truth. Now let's listen to this week's homily. Glory to Jesus Christ. My uh, beloved brothers and sisters, on this third week of the Triodian, our gospel reading is a bit of a shock to the system following the first two weekends. It's the first weekend, the Sunday of the publican and the Pharisee, we were reminded of the humility of the publican and the simple manner in which he entreated God for mercy on his soul. Last week, on the Sunday of the prodigal son, we were reminded that no matter how far we put ourselves from God, when we seek to return in repentance, he comes running to meet us and showers us with his limitless forgiveness. And these are wonderful, reassuring parables, which in our fallen and sinful state provide us a certain sustenance. They nourish our sickly souls and they give us hope that we too can receive forgiveness when we call on the father in humble repentance but the gospel reading today is a different reminder and make no mistake about it this is intentional it's like the church sees us sleeping out here and takes a bucket of cold water and throws it on us as if to say hey were you paying attention for the last two weeks because today we hear from Matthew's gospel, the account of the last judgment. I sometimes see it referred to as the parable of the last judgment, other times not, but I don't really think it's, it's much of a parable. I mean, maybe within it, when talking sheep and goats, we could having an element of parable built into it, but I don't think that this account pretends to be anything other than what it is. It's an account to those who hear it of what will happen when the Son of Man shall come in his glory. Through parables, we see the shadows of things that we're not able to understand, so they're taught to us in ways that we can understand. But here, Christ teaches us, as St. John Chrysostom says, more fearfully and with fuller light. And indeed, it is fearful. If there is a Sunday in Orthodoxy where we hear what the old Southern evangelists would call fire and brimstone preaching, it's this Sunday. Because we hear the reward coming to those at the time of judgment who shall find themselves separated from God, or as the gospel account says, counted among the goats. So let us hear, in fact, these fearful words. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then we hear the converse. And then he will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Now, we've talked about this before, and we often return to it during the year when we're, we're, when we're reminded of how our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ manifests itself in the fruits of our actions. But on this day, let's solemnly note that the sorting of the nations unabashedly looks at those before the judgment seat of Christ and rewards them for their deeds for what they have done, and for what they have left undone. And there is no asterisk here. There is no footnote here 
saying, but if you don't do these things, but you're filled with faith, you'll be with the sheep. You don't find an A&E special on the lost portions of the Gospel of Matthew that's supposed to, to cover what's not in this account of the last judgment. It says what it says. It's no promise of universal salvation. For those who find themselves with the goats, there's only the everlasting fire. And this is why in the liturgy, when we sing the petition for a good defense before the dread judgment seat of Christ, we sing it, or at least I do when I'm doing it, with a little extra solemnity, a little extra emphasis than the other petitions, because this gospel reading is precisely that dread judgment seat of Christ that the liturgy references. It is at that time that we will be judged and our deeds will ever either acquit us or they will convict us. But what about our faith? Someone these days might ask. Aren't we promised that faith alone will save us? Well, actually we're not. Faith alone is an invention of the Reformation. The only time the words faith alone appear in the scripture, it's a negative context. Rather, when we view scripture as a whole, we find that our faith and our deeds work together. The faith is what gives rise to our deeds, and the deeds are what give life to our faith. But the idea that our judgment will account for our deeds is biblical to the core. Interesting, interestingly, one of the most explicit references to this is from Paul's epistle to the Romans, where he says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. And then he goes on to say, you know, if you continue in patience and honor and glory, you seek patience, honor, and glory, you'll find the eternal life. But if you're contentious, if you don't obey truth, if you obey unrighteousness, indignation, wrath, then you'll find yourself in tribulation. And I say that's interesting because it comes just a chapter after the verse that Martin Luther relied on so heavily that just shall live by faith in formulating his doctrine of faith alone, sola fide. Maybe that's a reminder not to stop reading the Bible just because you found a verse that you like. Maybe you should keep going and see what it, what it really means and how it's actually applied. Paul doesn't just refer to this in isolations. In 2 Corinthians, he says, For we must all be manifested before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the proper things of the body according as he has done, whether good or evil. And even in John's Apocalypse and Revelation 20.12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Which, by the way, if you attend Vespers, I always say come to Vespers if you want to know what the, the gospel reading for tomorrow is going to be about or you want to know what the feast is about. In the Vespers, uh, Stakira last night, we sing when the books were opened and the accounts of all laid bare. Now, it's always at this point after I've read all these verses, I say, all right, let's pause because before we get accused of preaching a work-based <coughs> salvation, let's be clear that no work that we do is sufficient to merit our salvation. There's no amount of works that we must do for salvation. There's no amount of money we have to give. There's no amount of mouths that we have to feed. <coughs> and that's a good thing because we're all different in our gifts and we're all different in our resources. And God being gracious requires only what is within our power. Or rather, even less than what's within our power, leaving us to exert our generosity in doing more. The poor and the rich both will be judged by their deeds. But as Luke reminds us, unto whomsoever much is given of him much shall be required. It's different standards by what a person has been blessed with. Both the rich, the poor, the physically able, the physically weak. Both can be counted with the sheep, but based on very different evidence. Still, 
as much good as we might do, we all will fall short of the glory of God. Why? Because we sin. These deeds, however, are our defense. They are that which is laid before the judge for consideration. They are evidence not of our purity, but of what? Our faith. It's our faith which enlivens us to the working of good, and it's the working of good that testifies to the vitality of our faith. And to make that final link, I want to revisit the wonder of both those who are being saved and those who are being cast into the pit when the basis of their judgment was revealed to them because they asked the same thing in converse. For example, the righteous asked, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And, the, and Christ responds to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And in this telling answer, we see the link between our faith and our works. Let us remember the answer of Christ when he was tested and asked the greatest of the commandments. He answered with his two great commandments, love the Lord God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who is Christ saying that the righteous fed and gave drink to, sheltered, clothed, and visited? Our neighbor. And who's our neighbor? It's the least among us. And so this answers for the second commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. But what of the first? That we must love God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind? Well, let's simply remember the words of Christ given to us in the Gospel of John. If you love me, keep my commandments. Our deeds, which form the basis of our judgment, are the living testimony of our faith, of our love of God, of our love for neighbor, and of the keeping of the commandments. Because we know our sin will mark us short of the glory of God, let us with fear and trembling come before God, not merely confessing and repenting of our sin, but having cultivated the fruits of faith in love of neighbor and love of Christ. No, our works aren't going to save us. Only the mercy of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ can do that but they are the only defense we will have before his judgment seat. Christ asked Peter three times, do you love me? And Peter couldn't answer straightly. We may never be given the opportunity to answer that question because our deeds will already have testified to that answer. So brothers and sisters, as we enter this final week before the great fast, let us give thanks to God for his mercy, for his forgiveness, and for the cautionary warning of today's gospel that we may never forget that our faith in God is evidenced in our love for our brother, in the keeping of his commandments, not to the merit of our salvation, but by means of the pleading for the mercy necessary to overlook our sinful state. That with those sheep who stand on the right side, we may hear those faithful words, Come, you blessed of the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, glory to Jesus Christ. Thanks for listening to Hill Country Homilies. For more information, visit Holy Annunciation Orthodox Church at www.annunciationtx.com. And please join us again next week.